uh, today's topic, uh, the outlook on distressed and high yield. Uh, I'd like to welcome our speakers. Um, sitting to my left is David Matlin, a Managing Director of uh, Credit Suisse First Boston, which he joined in 1994. Uh, he heads the Global Special Situations and Workout Group uh, from New York and manages the firm's overall proprietary uh, trading activity in distressed securities. Uh, to his left is uh, Tim Peterson, President of uh, Regiment Capital Advisors. Uh, Tim started the high yield effort at Harvard Management uh, Company in 1998, focusing on traditional high yield approach with a hedge uh, strategy overlay component. Uh, in 1998, uh, Tim founded Regiment Capital Advisors and also formed the Norse CBO, and he continued, uh, continues to manage Harvard's high yield assets. Sitting uh, to Tim's left is uh, Jean-Louis Lelager. Uh, Jean is uh, the president of Moore Strategic Value Partners, LLC, a joint venture formed with Moore Capital Management to build a global uh, distressed securities business initially focused in Japan. Um, uh, prior to joining the, um, uh, the manager, uh, Mr. Lelager headed Lelager & Company, an advisory firm focused on strategic management issues and global wholesale financial services. Prior to that, he was a managing director at Chase Manhattan Bank, where he led the global bank uh, strategic repositioning. Um, but before we get started, I'd like to uh, thank our sponsor today, Vencast. Uh, John, do you have a few words for us? Uh, welcome, and thank you for coming. Um, just for those who don't know, and I think most, uh, many of you do, um, Vencast is a financial service firm uh, that focuses on private equity, venture capital, and hedge funds, and we represent managers in those uh, arenas uh, uh, help them raise capital. One of the things we do also is this video uh, of this presentation that all investors here are welcome to see. If you haven't already uh, given us your business card, please don't hesitate to. Um, I really want to especially thank um, uh, our speakers today, um, uh, both David and Tim for coming, but especially Jean-Louis. Jean-Louis uh, has rearranged his Asian trip, um, especially to be here. He was supposed to be overseas uh, during this week um, and uh, didn't rearrange it so he could be here today. He's uh, just finishing up his fundraising on his, uh, on his fund, uh, which will be closing March 15th. And so uh, just a special thanks to him for rearranging that. Thanks, John. Uh, Ron, do you have any words first? Yeah. I'm changing my name to Barry White. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ron. Uh, with that, David, would you uh, like to give us your perspective on the high yield distress rate? John Lloyd? Yeah, thank you. Your perspective? Mm -hmm. uh, but building on David and uh, Tim's comment, I think that uh, there's no question, which is you know, why this crowd, that uh, we have a very interesting demand supply uh, circumstances in the global high yield distress markets. Uh, the, the amount of supply that's materialized you know, over the past couple of years is now starting to be very, very large. And the amount of capital lined up to take advantage of that opportunity is, 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 is small. So th there's no question that there's, from a top-down perspective, very interesting set of opportunity on the global scale. Uh, there's also no question as Tim mentioned, that you know, global distress investing requires a bottom-up perspective, and that you need to understand very and be very selective in what it is that you buy and, and know exactly what you're getting into in terms of risk return liquidity standpoint. Having said that, I wanted possibly to, to provide a different angle to, to the comments on the market and, and uh, kind of walk essentially around the globe uh, to, to, to paint a little bit the, the picture. Uh, and maybe possibly contrast what's happening in, in, in my part of the world, which is Japan, to, uh, to what's happening in the U.S. and, and Europe. Uh, and there were comparisons to, uh, to 1990 and 1991 in, in the States. Uh, U.S. distress hadn't been a very good market, you know, in, in the past two, three years. Uh, we're starting, obviously, to see now a very interesting demand supply imbalance. Uh, Europe. Is, is lagging a bit, but it's starting to be a very interesting situation. Asia has been battered, and, and, and is also obviously a market where, where opportunities will be. Japan is, is spent in a very unique uh, 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 state of, of, uh, of, of the country. Japan is the second largest economy in the world, uh, and bubble in Japan burst 10 years ago. Since then, you know, real estate prices are up 80% from their peak. For the longest time, the financial institution in Japan didn't do anything about it. You know, the bad debt problem was accumulating, didn't do anything about it. So if I contrast 
what's going on in Japan to maybe what's happening, what was happening in the States in the RTC days and the SNL crisis, which all my colleagues would say were, were some golden years early on in terms of returns. What you have in Japan is an accumulated bad debt problem, which is four, five, six times the equivalent problem with the States, early 1990s. Japan is a, is, is a country of, of large numbers when it comes to distress, a massive problem. Uh, in the States, peak years, default years, 50 billion, 1990, 1991. In Japan, 10 years, 10 years of bankruptcies, levels of more than 50 billion. Last year, 2000, 200 billion. The level of, of, of supply is just gigantic. And on the demand side, you know, it's a, it's a market that's, as Tim said, a difficult market to enter. Uh, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's not for everybody to take kind of essentially what is a U.S. investment and work out sets of skills and try to adapt them in a, in a Japanese context. So, you know, from our standpoint or our viewpoint, you know, we see obviously a U.S. market that is extremely interesting now, starting to be very interesting, uh, Europe to a lesser extent. Uh, but, but when it comes to looking at really an overall demand supply imbalance, Japan is a fairly unique situation. And, and the country has started uh, in earnest in the past two years. It's a market that's fairly recent to deal with the problem in earnest. Uh, the government mandated that the uh, banks would start writing down the, the bad debts, you know, and mark down their loans to back up company to uh, 100 cents on the dollar. So that now that the Japanese banks are selling to people like us at five cents on the dollar, and again, you know, think RTC days, those diversified uh, uh, secure NPL portfolios, they're recreating equity value. So the, 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 the business has started in earnest. In terms of risk return liquidity, which I think is, is what Tim has been, has been referring to, that's also a very interesting space. Because you know, in the States, the contrast that today, you know, you buy some, some distressed debt, your exits are still capital markets exits. You need a high yield market, that's a solid high yield market. You know, you see a Russell 2000 stock market that's going to be solid, and, and, and you're dependent on capital markets. What Japan is going through is literally the equivalent of RTC days. No capital markets exits. You know, it's those granular loans that you go and work out, uh, and, and, and work out, you know, with a servicing company or what have you. And therefore, what you have is investments that have about an 18 months, tw two year, average life, very short duration, and no correlation with any market that you can think of. Nikkei was down 30% last year. No impact to the returns. And the impact and the returns have been very, very high returns. Um, you know, high yield market was going nowhere in the States, no impact to the returns in Japan. And, and, what, you, and uh, what is also interesting about Japan, by contrasting it to, uh, David, to, to Asia, the rest of Asia, uh, is that there's a rule of law that is extremely creditor friendly. You go in Asia, there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a book that tells you, you know, here's the bankruptcy law. But if you sit around the table for a Thai tycoon, no matter what the law says, you're going to get hurt. In Japan, the court will always come on the side of the creditor. So, you know, from our viewpoint, again, Japan is a, is a fairly unique once in a lifetime, you know, sweet, sweet spot opportunity. Need to know, like everything, you know, like everything else, you know, where, where, where you go, the, the, uh, the portfolios that you buy. Uh, it's a brand new business, but I want you need to have a set of skills. But an interesting, interesting uh, spot in the, in the landscape of the more high uh, distress. Thanks, John Louis. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I'm a little bit concerned with all due respect to the size of the crowd. Uh, we uh, sort of pride ourselves of being contrarian. And uh, any time there's more than about three people in the room, and in my opinion, I uh, begin to think that we're in the mainstream and perhaps our investment uh, opportunities aren't what uh, I, I quite think them to be. Um, the outlook for uh, distressed securities, for, uh, for acquiring them and that, for uh, sort of watching one's portfolio uh, disintegrate, um, really has never been uh, stronger in my 15 years in the business. And um, it, it's sort of an unusual time. Uh, for the uh, for the sector because it's uh, it's not as if there's sort of one uh, reason why there's uh, record levels of defaults. Uh, there's sort of a confluence of events 
that has uh, created a, a defaulted security market uh, of about uh, $400 billion of uh, distressed securities, uh, which compares maybe to a market uh, sort of in the good old days of distress of maybe uh, $50 billion uh, back in 1991-1992. Uh, and um, it's really throughout all, uh, all sectors, probably other than uh, oil and oil service, uh, today and for a variety of reasons. Um, it starts maybe with uh, just sort of good old uh, uh, exuberance um, and uh, excessive lending and deterioration of uh, real uh, uh, credit skills. Um, you, uh, you see a, a rash of uh, uh, bankruptcies in telecommunications uh, throughout technology companies and uh, 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 companies such as uh, uh, theaters, just uh, plain old-fashioned overbuilding and, and uh, uh, a view that uh, the trees would continue to grow to the heavens. Uh, there's bureaucratic bundling really responsible for, for uh, uh, things like uh, uh, the energy crisis in, in Southern California and uh, defaults of uh, uh, Southern California Edison, which uh, who, would, who would have ever imagined. Uh, also largely responsible for for the health care uh, uh, defaults. Um, there's good old-fashioned uh, cyclicality if you look throughout uh, uh, the automotive sector or uh, throughout manufacturing. There's a strong dollar that's to blame uh, throughout a lot of these industries. And there's, there's high fuel prices, which is hurting uh, commodity chemical manufacturers and the like. So there's lots of different reasons uh, why uh, uh, there's a sort of record level of default. And, um, you know, a lot of people sort of look at the landscape and say, well, that's true, you know, there's, there's a lot to sort of pick and choose from, not only in the United States, but also in, in Europe, uh, which is maybe 18 months or 24 months sort of behind our, our credit cycle, and goodness, there's, there's still a lot of companies uh, in Asia that uh, really haven't restructured, uh, they put a, a band-aid fix around uh, problems in, in Korea, and any of you are unfortunate enough to have invested in Southeast Asia know that those markets were down 50 and 60 percent and 20 percent in Malaysia respectively. So it's been an absolute mess uh, around the world. And you know, why should anyone uh, think that this is the bottom or that uh, things are necessarily going to improve? Um, this isn't like the early, early 90s where there are a lot of good companies with bad balance sheets, and, uh, and all that is true. But uh, from our viewpoint, um, the, uh, the interesting thing about our marketplace is that uh, people tend to make these generalizations um, and, and tend to uh, sort of lump all of these uh, companies into one uh, barely work when things go bad, and you can make a sweeping statement like, well, you know, there's no, there's no uh, uh, U.S. textile manufacturing company that deserves to live. And that's probably true. Um, that sector probably has no right to exist uh, uh, in the United States. But does that mean that you know, there aren't going to be one out of you know, 15 distressed textile companies that are going to be interesting? No, it doesn't. There, there probably is going to be one or two. Um, are there going to be one or two uh, subprime financial services companies that uh, have a right to exist in this country? Probably. Do all of the nursing home operators, I think there's 11 out of 13 that are uh, defaulted, do they have a right to exist? Well, those of us with grandparents and mom and dads and sort of an aging baby boom population and even perhaps a not so friendly Congress would probably argue that um, they do have a right to exist. So um, the, the sort of trick in our business is to um, get out of the way when the world is coming to an end, which uh, may have already happened, and uh, to then sort of step back rationally and uh, look across um, a variety of, uh, of different industries and, and different regions and try to discern those that uh, really uh, don't fit the generalizations. And um, I think that the, the nice part about um, our business is that um, you know, virtually uh, no one uh, in the uh, respected uh, investment cycles wants to be seen having owned these securities. So there's a lot of non-economic reasons why uh, people tend to, uh, tend to discard uh, defaulted securities. You know, there's, there's structural issues. You know. Banks uh, have to get rid of non-performing loans. Uh, they have to go into workout departments, and, and uh, these folks uh, tend to have their own agenda. There's a you know, uh, you know a huge amount of uh, uh, CBOs that were uh, uh, placed on the marketplace during the last uh, three four years. And I think about a quarter of all uh, high yield bond issuances went into uh, uh, CBOs. Well, uh, they have a 
real uh, structural issue when, when there's defaults. There's covenant requirements that force people into, into selling these things, whether or not uh, uh, it's necessarily a prudent thing to do. So um, just because someone's selling it and uh, it's unloved, obviously uh, uh, doesn't mean anything more than uh, a potentially good opportunity. And uh, the trick of, of our business really is to is to find those uh, diamonds in the rough. And it's a lot easier to, to find those diamonds when there's um, 700 issuers in default than when there's when there's 35. And uh, you can really uh, look across uh, the spectrum of defaulted uh, of, uh, securities and really pick and choose based on your own investment style and the, the, the sort of approach that you want to take to our business. There's lots of opportunities if you want to play sort of a bounce in the marketplace. If, if uh, you think that you can sort of time uh, events better than, uh, than most and, and you sort of see these large macro trends and, and you want to kind of take advantage of them, there's a number of managers who really have those sorts of trading skills. Um, we are sort of uh, you know, playing a game of, of waiting for the, the flows to come back to uh, high yield funds and uh, waiting for, for uh, institutional investors to, uh, to come back to uh, this sector. And that's a great strategy. Those managers are going to be able to generate, I think, in this sort of marketplace, uh, 19 to 25 percent IRRs, really at the top of uh, a defaulted company's capital structure, which really is the first time in, in 10 years that uh, I think anybody's been able to make that statement. If your view is a little longer term, and uh, you not only want to play maybe just a, a small macro balance, but um, you think that there's some very good uh, businesses that uh, are cyclically depressed. You want to make a bet on the automotive sector or on, on healthcare, or whatever your view is. Um, there's a number of managers who uh, I think have the ability to ride out uh, those cycles a little longer term, uh, maybe a year and a half or two years. And there's probably higher IRRs associated with that. And if you um, uh, sort of view the world uh, maybe a little more uh, as uh, our investment uh, approach allows, which is really really trying to uh, buy businesses and control them uh, at the bottom of uh, economic cycles. Well, I think there's an ability to get, you know, uh, uh, really high quartile LBO type returns, uh, uh, north of 40 percent and what have you, sitting out the longer term cycle. So there's sort of uh, uh, a lot of opportunity across a, uh, a wide variety of strategies that uh, this sort of, uh, of uh, market environment affords. Thanks for the overview. Tim, give uh, your view. Sure. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, what I'd like to do is just briefly, <coughs> excuse me, is kind of give an outline of you know, why all of you are probably here today. Uh, give a sense of probably what are some of your options to think about when you're looking at high yield as an asset class, whether it's distressed or traditional high yield. And maybe as you kind of step away from this meeting, having a perspective of what are the good, the bad, and the ugly that go with each of these categories. Um, you know, one of the things that everybody's talking about, and I'm sure the reason there's so much interest, whether it's everything you read in the paper, uh, whether you hear it from your advisors, whatever, is that high yield is a great asset class right now. It's cheap. And I think it's important to keep in perspective, you know, we've come from a couple of years of record defaults, as David talked about, you know, downgrades, what I'd call sector shocks, whether it's the automotive sector or the asbestos issues and so forth. But all of that has led to nothing but terrible news, which suddenly makes us opportunity that everybody thinks now is a great time to buy high yield or distressed. And I will tell you right now that I can't predict that at all. But I think it's important to get some perspective to maybe give everybody a sense of you know, where we're coming from and what really are the opportunities. So, for example, one of the pitches that you'll hear and think about is that spreads are at historical wise. And now because of that, it's a good time to buy high yield bonds. Well, if you talk, and I think David and almost everybody would agree that what we really have here is statistics. And the statistics say that we're at historical wide spreads of 850 or 900 basis points. And what it really fails to really talk about is the market has become totally polar. You have the better quality names trading at 350 to 400, and then you have the rest of the portfolio trading at 900 to 2700. So, for example, a typical double B right now might trade at 400 off, a single B will be at 900 off, and the triple C basket is 2700 off the curve. When you blend them all together and you get 850 to 900, and that's why the market's cheap. And I think it really kind of fails to recognize that a lot of people probably don't want a totally approach of buying 18% of their portfolio in triple C's and 25 in double B's. 
And so I think the whole concept of now is a historical narrow or widespread issue to whether to get in or out of the market probably fails to recognize that this is not a market that has instant liquidity. This is not a market that has a index product that you can go to on a daily basis. It does not have a futures contract. Uh, when I was at Harvard for 12 years, we were actively involved in doing high yield interest rate swaps. We still do that, but this market also tends to run curve mentalities. So to be able to kind of get in and out of the market when you want is very difficult. So I think this whole concept of statistics and saying now is a cheap time to buy, I think you have to really step back and think about it weigh what are your options and what do you want to get into in this asset class and I'll go through I think six alternatives of how to look at high yield. Another thing that you'll hear about is Merrill Lynch has I think done a very good job in uh, promoting and educating everybody including investors um, and one of the statistics they have right now is what they call the stress ratio which is how many issues actually trade over a thousand basis points above the curve and historically that's probably somewhere between six and ten Today it's 30, and I think this is kind of what David hit on is there's a huge multitude of opportunities right now. The flip side is that that 30% of the market is, you know, a large part of that is triple C names that you might or not want to get involved in. So here again, I think statistics and generalizations are very difficult because the high yield market doesn't allow you to generalize. It requires you to get very specific on credits. So what does all that mean? Well, I think one of the big things that people talk about are, you know, is this going to be like 1991 and 92 where the market went up 30 to 40 percent? And is now a good time to get involved in high yield because it'll be like 91 and 92? And I think here again we need to step back and look at what are the, what are the similarities and what are the differences to 1991 and 92? Um, I think the differences are, you know, one, we still are in an environment where actually undecided whether we were even in a recession or going into one versus one where we in theory were coming out of one. Um, I think there is a good chance that we'll have a good year this year in terms of total return and high yield. But I don't think it's going to change the fact that Moody's is estimating 9 to 11 percent default rates. Um, I think it's still going to be a very tough credit specific market. And I also think it's important to keep in perspective that in 1991 and 92, the market was basically at that time was about 6% telecommunications and now it represents 20 to 30%. So back in 91 and 92, the triple C portfolio, the triple C component of the index went up 45%. Um, to keep that in perspective, that really meant that the market in that period went from about 2,700 basis points of spread to, 20, uh, about, to about uh, 400 basis points in spread. Uh, the triple C basket narrowed 2,300 basis points in that period. Um, unless the NASDAQ and or the telecommunication market rallies dramatically, I think seeing the triple C market narrow by 22 or 2,300 basis points and get down to 400 off the curve is pretty unlikely. And so here again, I don't know if the perspective of saying that this is going to be like 91 and 92 is accurate on a global basis. So here again, I think it's important to keep in mind, you know, what are your options, recognize that it might be a great opportunity, but generalization, you know, keep, it, keep an open mind. What does that say for today? Well, as I'm sure many of you are also aware, January was a record month. Um, it was probably the second best month in the last 10 or 15 years in high yield. Market was up somewhere between 6 and 8 percent, depending on which index you use. Spreads tightened by 113 basis points. Double Bs are now 400 off. And so, once again, you get into this question of, have you missed out? You know, did you miss the opportunity if you're not invested already? And my answer is, I have no clue. Um, I think the big thing is, once again, I think you have some opportunities on uh, a credit-specific basis, and I think you have some opportunities on deciding what portfolio strategy you want to take in this high-yield market. And so, you know, what that really leads to, I think, is what are your options? You know, where do you want to try to focus your assets if you want to get involved in the high-yield arena? And I think the key ingredients are what your time horizon is and what kind of risk profile you want to take. You know, this, as I said before, is not a liquid asset class, so make that a big decision on how you want to invest the money. And once you make that decision, then I think you have basically six options on how you want to focus your high-yield exposure. 
One is a traditional long-only strategy, kind of like a mutual fund approach. This is probably the bulk of 35 to 40 percent of the high yield market. Um, we don't employ that approach. Um, I, after the meeting's over, people would like to ask why I think it's good, bad, and ugly. I'd be happy to address that. But that is an option that most people pursue. Second option is what David talked about, which is the distressed area. Uh, we think there's probably opportunities in that. But also keep in mind that I think you need to go in with a framework of your distressed manager. What kind of approach does he take? And David mentioned more and more, I think, of the distressed community over the last couple of years because it's been such a difficult market where last year it was down 40%. Um, you know, getting your principal back if you're down 40% takes a long time. And so what a lot of managers in the distressed area have done has been shifting their focus to the higher quality slash what I call senior secured bank loans at discounts. That's an interesting strategy in the distressed area. Just keep in mind it probably means that the opportunities for large, large returns are a little less than like David mentioned if you're playing in the triple C arena where you're really looking for a longer term perspective. So I think you've got to kind of weigh what kind of a distressed manager you want to focus on. A third approach um, is more an approach of a worldwide approach. You know, do you want to get involved in the European and Asian market? And here again, I think what you need in that arena is someone that's willing to dedicate full time to that focus. We don't believe that that's a focus that a domestic high yield traditional player should get involved in. It's tough enough assessing risk here in the United States without assessing currency risk, political risk, economic risk, and lack of bankruptcy law risk in all these countries. So I think you need a real focus to do that, which I'm sure you'll hear about today. Uh, the fourth approach is just get involved in what they call prime funds or bank loan product, and bank loans only. Don't do any high yield traditional bonds. You know, this provides some interesting characteristics. The goal is to earn live work plus 250 to 400. Some managers leverage that portfolio. I think here again, when you analyze or are looking at managers that do that, Make sure that you really assess are they using leverage in their return profiles and recognize that 99% of bank loans have, uh, unless you're buying it at distress levels, they have you know, no points of upside and 60, 70, 80 points of downside if you pick the wrong bank loan. So here again, I think it's important that you keep perspective of how you look at a manager, but it is an asset class that offers historically lower volatility and very, very decent risk return profiles. Fifth approach is CBOs. And here again, David mentioned CBOs. It's become a big part of the arena in high yield. The CBOs, you can get involved in both all the way from the senior debt all the way down to the equity of a CBO. The trade-offs are pretty simple. Liquidity. Um, they typically have much worse liquidity than a traditional approach. But you do get leverage in the system, which allows you some return profiles that could be attractive if the market returns and you time the market pretty well. And then the last approach is what I just call other. And that would be kind of a category of a group that either totally focuses on a specific sector or approach like I would consider what we have, which is really an approach of what I always focus on in our portfolios is a risk-adjusted return profile. And the key for us is really assessing the entire capital structure. You know, we, we're a big believer that the way that you underperform in high yield is pigeonhole yourself into asset classes and say, I'm a prime fund only, or I'm a high yield fund only, or I'm a distressed fund only, because each of those at points in time don't offer the best risk return profile. And so our focus and what I really started up at Harvard, you know, 12, 13 years ago when we officially left about a year ago, was really a focus of can I look up and down the entire capital structure of a company and assess where the best risk return profile is and do I have a competitive edge? And I think that's the key question you need. If you're interested in high yield, ask the manager what their competitive edge is. And you know, I think for us the competitive edge basically is how can we do things that other people can't do, won't do, and don't think about doing. And so one of the things that we've historically done is always look to do some things that other people can't do. We've been historically pretty involved in intercapital arbitrage and high yield. We look to do default protection ideas. We use options to try, try to lower our risk return profile. And it's a strategy that's not used a great deal because it's not in the traditional realm of a long only approach or a CBO approach or a distressed approach. But I think that's the kind of opportunities that you have out in the marketplace right now. Uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions if you have any more questions. But I would again stress 
think about what strategy you want to approach and then proceed accordingly. Thanks, Tim. Take any questions now. Banks don't seem to want to hold loans anymore. As a consequence, a lot of non bank, non traditional entities are showing up with senior credits. How do you think that's going to affect uh, this next process, this next phase of, of trouble as these companies get into trouble? Well, I, th I think it's going to make it easier to, to work these things out because it's kind of like a basketball player, you know, that only can go to his right. You can put five guys on and, and to the right of them, and he can't go to his left, and the banks can never go to their left. So, you always know what they want to do. It's, well, I want new bank debt uh, doing a restructuring because you know, that's my currency, by golly. And um, you, you, they create a huge um, uh, option to restructuring most companies because, in, in, in my experience, um, you know, they, they do the worst thing you could ever do, which is trade your cost. It's, it's idiotic. But um, if they put the bank loan on 100 cents, they want 100 cent recovery, even though uh, you know, the company may not be able to support 100 cent new debt, or they get you know, a bond and a pick note and some warrants, and gee, maybe they can market at 100. Um, it creates a uh, sort of an uneconomic way to reorganize companies. The people you're talking about, like you know, sort of the Highland Capital of the world and sort of aggressive Prime Plus funds, um, have the ability to uh, be a lot more flexible than banks ever had. They'll take new hundred cent dollars out of their pocket, and if this company needs, you know, to uh, spend, uh, you know, 50 million in capex, well, okay, we'll do it, and maybe we'll take more equity than the banks would ever dream of taking. So I think it's going to make it easier to restructure these things. Well, I would agree with David, but I think what, what you're seeing, I think you're probably right, is one of the th two things that's going to happen. It's going to increase volatility of bank loans because institutional holders tend to be willing to do more than what David said, which is treat it as market value, and therefore you're willing to sell it. If you don't want to have it for your marketing purposes to show up as a default, you just get rid of it. And so I think it's actually going to increase the volatility of bank loans. And I also think it's probably going to potentially lead to, um, although you could probably get solutions done, it's also going to lead to probably, I think, some degree of re average recovery rate of bonds on, a, on the bond side to go even lower than historical. Because what you're getting now is, is a scenario where the, the, the distressed players are getting involved in senior securities are becoming much more different than it was 10 years ago when there was this norm that the bank loans would get twice as much as the bonds. Well, now the people that are buying the distressed bank loans tend to have it and treat it as, hey, we're, we're senior capital structure, we get everything, and the guy below us gets close to nothing until we get close to out, or at least our cost. And so I think it's probably going to increase volatility. It's probably going to create a little bit more tension in the restructurings. Um, but I do think you also have probably a more rational uh, approach to what is the right alternative to, to fix the problems. But I think there will be some dislocation for a while. Steve McCarthy, and that's for your answer. I'll leave the question. Actually, I'll have three. Um, <laughs> listening to the three gentlemen uh, reminds me of two comments. One, uh, we're second, we seem to be in the second year of uh, investing dangerously in the fixed income markets. Um, but also listening to you reminds me of the Yogi Berraism, which is when you get to the road, uh, fork in the road, take it. But I want to get it specific. Jean-Louis, uh, Japan is well as probably the worst credit risk manager in the world. Not surprisingly, they've had a major problem. What happens when the banks have to mark to market their portfolio fiscal year end 331, and what is that impact going to do restructuring in the financial sector? Tim, specifically, uh, I read where Wilbur Ross likes to the room. Give me a flavor on the financials, Conseco and uh, uh, Finova. What do you think of that? And on the uh, retail side, we had a, Mr. Hokinson talk to us last time about the bankruptcies and the batteries and whatnot. What do you think of that credit? And David, one of the acronyms floating out there these days, particularly appropriate after Valentine's Day, is show me a little love, L-U-V. And that means the contractionary and uh, recovery cycle in the economy. If we go down and flat versus U versus V, what does that do to the fixed income market and distressed? 
thought I had the last one. Think about it. That wasn't fair. Well, I, I think um, the uh, we try to take the economy out of um, all of our. Uh, investments in distress, and it's it's not always an easy thing to do. But what we're trying to do anyway is try to buy companies at three to five times trough cash flow. And in order to buy them at trough cash flow, uh, unfortunately, you need to know what trough is. So you won't see Credit Suisse or Boston starting to accumulate in the automotive sector, for example, because I have no clue what uh, uh, trough cash flow is. I have an opinion on when the economy is going to bottom, but I'm always wrong. So you know, I don't want to listen to that. Um, so you you can't buy uh, uh, the automotive sector if, unless you know that there's going to be 11 million cars produced instead of 30 or 15 or what have you. Uh, but you can buy other sectors that have absolutely nothing to do, as Jean-Louis was saying, with uh, where the economic cycle is. You can buy into health care because, gee, you've got a great demographic trend with the uh, aging population. You know, you have uh, uh, companies operating at four and a half times cash flow, uh, which is sort of their break-even level. And you, you probably don't have the ability to cut that anymore. So that is Trump cash flow. I can buy into that. I can buy into the chemicals right now because even though the economy hasn't bottomed, and maybe you can create some of these chemical companies that are at five times normalized cash flow specifically. Well, what's so great about that? Well, the great thing is, what if you know you impute a four dollar natural gas price instead of six fifty? And what if you start imputing, you know, twenty three dollar crude instead of thirty two dollar crude? And gee, if the dollar weakens a little bit, all of a sudden you bought that company at two times cash flow. That, that's a pretty good deal, and, and offers a lot more upside than downside. And those are the sort of of, uh, of companies that uh, we want to go after. Uh, regarding a couple uh, names you had mentioned, um, and I think they make an interesting point. Uh, first of all, we historically avoid certain sectors that we feel we never can really analyze effectively. Uh, so telecommunications is an area where we think it's evolving so much all the time that we tend to way, way underweight better not have exposure to it. And the retail sector is another sector where we think, as a bondholder, the risk-adjusted return on a high-yield bond is just so unattractive. Um, so things like uh, Bradley's or Ames or things like that, we tend not to get involved in. And things like a Conseco and a Finova, those are great examples because I think they're an interesting example for the following reason. These were kind of an investment grade, high yield, high grade, high yield bonds um, <clears throat> that shocked a lot of people in terms of how quickly they went down. And one of the things that I think we try to do, and we've done historically a pretty good job at, is focused on this whole concept of risk-adjusted return and a focus on what we kind of call critical event dates. And we always, as all high-yield managers that are traditional and distressed, yield to call, yield to worst, yield to maturity is important. But keep in mind, high-yield bonds never go in linear lines. They go up or they go down, but they never go in linear lines. So oftentimes one of the key ingredients when you analyze these credits are what is a critical event date? What, what is going to cause the credit to change the perception of the, in the market? And Conseco is a great example where if you looked at that a year and a half ago, you would have seen they had a huge commercial paper program that was coming up, and they had some liquidity. If you looked at it, if the capital markets weren't there, they had some issues with their program. Well, that's a strategy that if you believe that, you have three options. One, you take an opinion and you go along the product and think you're going to get it cheap. Two, you just avoid it entirely. Or three, you develop a hedging strategy. So that's one where we thought there was going to be some inherent volatility in Conseco. Uh, we actually went long a senior bond, shorted a subordinate bond, and basically just played that credit on, on an option volatility trade. And the spread widened out dramatically. Um, so what we've really tried to do in that situation is strip out credit risk and just buy volatility risk. Um, what do I think of Conseco now? Uh, you know, they've got the new management in there. Uh, once that happened, perceptions changed. Access to the, high, you know, to the capital markets seemed like they got better. Uh, Wall Street was very happy to help try to create solutions and uh, you know, build in a better business and collect some fees. So that was probably something that's got a viability. Uh, once some of those things happened, we unwound our trade, and I have, we don't really have a strong opinion on Conseco at this point. Canova is a credit that we never did a lot of work. We focused on Conseco much more than Canova. Uh, so back to Japan. Uh, uh, no question that the uh, scarcity of credit skills in Japan is, is, is why actually people like us you know, feel like we're in a, in a candy store of opportunities. In terms of the outlook for the market, which is the question you're asking, and the pace of, of selling, 
Uh, again, you know, to put things in perspective, uh, I, I would tell you that uh, I think Japan is kind of the second inning of, of, of a baseball game. Last year, year ending March 2000, which is the uh, financial year end for J Japan, roughly 5 billion cash was spent like, uh, by people like us to buy roughly 100 billion of debt. Analysts would tell you that the bad debt problem in Japan is about 1.5 trillion, possibly up to 2 trillion phase. So as you can see, there's, there's a long ways to go. What's interesting is obviously you have, you have elements along the way that will change the, the uh, demographics of the, of the sellers of bad debt. Historically, since the market started early 1998, the large banks, the IBJs, the DJB, were, were the sellers. Uh, of, of, uh, of bad debt portfolios. In, in, in the past quarter, this, this quarter we're going through, we've seen them relatively less active. Nikkei down 30% hurts their position. You know, and, and all this mark-to-market you know, gives them a little bit less room where we all to take the losses. But to give you some perspective, another segment that just had, you know, appeared out of nowhere and is gigantic you know, today in Japan is bankrupt life insurance companies. To put things in perspective, Cure Life, 40 billion bankruptcy. And, and by the way, you know, if you compare it to U.S. Europe, the largest bankruptcy always talked about was Euro Tunnel, 13 billion of debt. Cure Life, 40 billion in debt. Cure Life, 27 billion dollar in debt. Cure Life, the, what happens in the case of a bankrupt life company, trustee gets appointed, tries to find a buyer for the life business. In the case of Cure Life, the sponsor, the front runner is AIG. In the, in, the, in, the, in the case of Cure Life, is potential of the U.S. Those buyers are not interested in the bad debt part. Of, of, so the trustee proceeds with very bumpy sales. Cure the Life, three weeks ago, 26 pools, first option, 2 billion cash was spent to buy that piece of paper. So as you can see, we will tell you this year, this coming year, you know, last year we could have a 5 billion, we are on an 8 billion dollar kind of pace. And, and by the way, to work out the 1.5 trillion inventory, you would need years at 30 billion a year to even start, you know, getting at pace to, to work out the problem. So, just just a massive, uh, massive, and, and 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 we expect the banks to move back in the market once they've, you know, uh, gone through the, all the mergers and repeated with the the equity base. They're telling us that they'll be back the uh, second quarter this year. Thank you. Business questions directed towards Tim. Um, it sounds like you've approached this business um, in some of the non-traditional ways in terms of the types of trades you put on. Do you ever uh, put naked shorts on par or close to par bonds that you think have, you know, what the underlying companies have deteriorating uh, credit fundamentals and then you know, you know, covering when they get distressed? Um, some occasion we do. Um, you know, our focus has always been a a high yield exposure with a hedging overlay strategy. The bulk of our trades tend to be on the hedging strategy on what we kind of call intra-capital arbitrage. We do very seldom do we do paired trades, which is a big you know, hedge fund approach of you know, going long one equity and shorting a different equity in the same industry. We don't do a lot of that. Uh, we do from time to time do outright shorts. Um, we... Um, in general, though, I would say that it's not our strategy, but we will do it. Uh, the other thing that we try to do, though, to some degree if, if in that scenario, um, is we'll look to actually buy default protection. You know, that's been a big product that's been evolving in Wall Street. Here again, I think you have to be willing to look forward and be opportunistic. Um, you know, a year ago, you could, could have bought Lucid default protection for 20 basis points like we did. Today, it's, you know, 400. Um, so I think you've got to be a little forward-looking, um, and you've got to be creative. I think this is, a, this is not a market where I think you can just be a traditional approach and try to achieve excess returns and, and have a positive alpha. I think you've got to be willing to be creative, whether it's on the distressed side, the European side, or the domestic side, and do things that other people don't do. And, and I think the key, too, is keep in mind that we all, I think, sometimes fail to recognize, unless you're buying at you know, distressed levels, that you know, we're, we're bonds. You know, we are not equities where one good equity can make up for five mistakes. This is the exact opposite. And I think that's why historically a lot of long-only approaches underperform the market. Um, You've got to be right 98% of the time. I can guarantee you there isn't many people, and I know we're not, capable of being right 98% of the time. 
so the whole key is how do you develop strategies to lower your risk profile and still achieve an attractive return? And that's what we try to do. Questions? I'm going to ask a naive question because I don't get embarrassed easy. Uh, but uh, Tim, when he uh, mentioned the values in the market, talked about spreads in comparing with uh, 1990 and 91. Um, it seems like this, the spreads, of course, I presume are measured off of the Treasury curve. And uh, having spent a little time in that market, it seems to me the supply might have uh, widened spreads, uh, given the surplus the government's been enjoying. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering if you factored that into your spread analysis. Um, it's very difficult to. I think the key that we always look at is, you know, spreads are an ingredient and you analyze credits, um, but I think there's still a degree of overuse of that product. You know, we, we can't predict and we never will attempt to predict where treasuries are going. I mean, that's, that's a whole different arena that I'm incapable of playing. So what we try to really are constantly looking at is keeping in mind what's your risk return profile, recognize where does this trade compare to where it historically has traded, and also recognize that what we really want to talk about, what I mentioned, and the reason I mention those issues to everyone, is not to try to convince people that today it's cheap or that it's not cheap. But keep in perspective, there are a lot of ingredients that can influence statistics and how you look at those statistics and making broad brush statements of it's a cheap market, whether it's because, you know, the supply is you know, good or bad, is probably not real material to a high yield exposure. John? Thank you. Uh, you're probably familiar with KMV. It's a credit consulting and modeling company, and uh, the, uh, the basis for uh, gauging credit default uh, experience or just credit health is to look at key variables in the equity markets. Uh, the fact there being that the lower the market capitalization, uh, the greater the risk of credit deterioration. Lack of access to capital translates into um, greater, greater default risk, and we to find out if you use that kind of um, analysis in your total analytical process. Is this directed to me? Well, all of you, actually. Uh, whoever, or whoever you may be joining. Uh, we, we always look at the capital markets, um, and I think here again, this is, you know, every, everybody that does high yield will always say that they look at the equity markets. I mean, I think it's, it's a given. Uh, I think it's a question of uh, priorities of that whole spectrum of how much you value those. And here again, it gets back to you can look at a credit, and if the bank loan is at LIBOR plus 350, and the bonds trade at 9%, um, and the equity's got some kind of an equity market cap, it, it still gets down to what's the best risk return profile. And I think the equity markets for us, we use as a gauge, we have monitors, and it's just one more ingredient in the puzzle. And remember, too, high yield still is a market that has a lot of private companies without public market caps. So there's then the huge assumptions of what the valuation of those private companies are, you know, using comps and everything else, which have, once again, exponential problems with making comparisons. I have no clue what the question was. <laughs> no, it doesn't pertain to our marketplace. We're really trying to uh, employ a, a very bottoms-up approach to each one of these credits. We're trying to take over companies and um, the ability to sort of put on uh, your credit default spreads is, is really not something that we ever engage in. And we spoke a lot about hedging, and that is one way to obviously approach the high-yield market in these kind of tough times. Um, so you were talking about controlling companies. Isn't that higher risk than some of these other approaches that we're talking about? Yeah, we don't think so, because um, the problems that most people get into in, in distressed investing, and John already touched on it a little bit, and so did Tim, is um, if you try to take a sort of a trading approach to the business, uh, you're subject to the vagaries of, you know, when the economic cycle is going to recover or not. Um, you're, you're getting into very illiquid names uh, without an exit. As John Lewis is saying, if you're just buying a, a defaulted bond, uh, or triple C, uh, at 30 cents in the dollar, and, and you're trying to you know, get 50 cents when the cycle comes back, or maybe you get a reinstated piece of paper, um, you're really looking for the greater fool to take you out. And sometimes that fool doesn't come along for uh, three or four years. What we're trying to do is really take ownership 
of these businesses and control our own exit, which is critical. Because unless you can uh, really uh, enjoy that control, um, you are just subject to the winds of the uh, Russell 2000, which is not a place that we want to be. So our strategy really is to try to acquire control through buying publicly traded defaulted securities, stabilize those businesses, um, you know, create them extreme valuation levels of three to five times, uh, repackage them, and then sell them to a strategic acquirer at you know, five to six times normalized cash flows. And that strategy is really uh, not correlated to anything that's going on, in our view, of uh, the publicly traded marketplaces or the ability to get an IPL out or not. So uh, it actually, um, even though you're buying a lot, at a lot lower dollar price and sometimes you're buying junior securities in order to get control, uh, in reality you end up with much higher returns than a traditional distressed investor would who is really playing a turbocharged fixed income game, if you will. Um, this is more of a, of a leverage buyout approach. So we think the risks are actually lower. Yeah, we, we, we would concur with, you know, as you get into uh, more medium-sized companies and so forth, you, you often want to be in charge of your own destiny, you know, driving the, 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 uh, on the creditor committee, driving, driving the restructuring. Uh, you know, what we, what we shy away from is uh, thinking of ourselves as private equity guys. So we'd like to restructure a company, get out as opposed to fall in love with the company and, 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 and think that we've become uh, your know, managers. So there's always a fine line of kind of sticking to your, to your core discipline. As a follow-up to Dave's opening remarks on the exuberance of the high yield markets in 97, 98, and how that was an explanatory factor as to why the high yield market is where it is now, and um, I'd like to hear a couple of opinions on the credit quality of the new insurance market in January. Uh, for the most part, from money managers I've been speaking to, and obviously from the, journal, the, the journalist industry, um, high yield insurance was uh, uh, only allowed to the most upper tier high yield issuers. Um, but on the other hand, the very prominent high yield manager that I spoke with said that that was certainly not the case, that investors were fully subject to voluntary amnesia, uh, relating back to what we saw in 97, 98. What's your, what's your opinions on, uh, on January's new issuance and uh, the market's exuberance for that? Um, I think in general, uh, January had bigger market cap companies that really came to the market. Companies that had equity market caps, high following in the equity markets. Um, you know, there was not a lot of, you know, I think there was 34 issues that were done in January. There were not a lot of them that I would consider um, small to mid cap kind of companies. Um, I, I would tend to agree that uh, the high yield market um, is in many cases influenced by inflows of money. Um, and therefore, memories become short when you have inflows of money. And you know, I remember 10 years ago, people said they'd never buy a zero coupon bond again. And the percentage of zero coupon bonds today is the same amount, percentage roughly as it was 10 years ago. Um, I remember 94, the same statement. So, you know, I think people at times, um, you know, what we, what we say and how we follow through is going to dictate whether you get someone that I think has a clear strategy of how to manage money. Um, but in general, it's the better quality names. That will be the deciding factor going forward. So, so for example, like let's talk about uh, Levi Strauss, who's uh, this manager mentioned specifically in his letter, they're paying a 13 half percent coupon uh, revenues declining year over year since '95, half of they were back then, and uh, all of a sudden now investors are clamoring for that for that issue. Um, have you looked at that credit specifically? Yeah, we've looked at it. Um, you know, they, they came with a bank loan at the same time. Um, we thought that the bank loan for the pricing that it came at was a much better risk return profile than the bonds. Um, but keep in mind, you have uh, some scenarios where the credit, the credit stats have been very difficult. Um, but sometimes when you get uh, inflows of money or you get CBOs that need to put money to work and they have a big coupon, people have different reasons for investing and it also gets down to at the same token um, managers in many cases are paid to put money to work and that doesn't necessarily mean that once again if you're pigeonholed into a category and you say okay you're a high yield traditional manager you can't do bank loans and you've got money in your 
pocket and you got and you got a fear factor and the fear is I'm going to underperform if the market keeps rallying and you have limited supply um, because you got all this money sometimes you do things that maybe you don't want to do and that's been our whole approach if that is the worst way to manage money um, you do not want to get into pigeonholing yourself and you don't want to get into having to have inflows and outflows of money all the time and that's the things that we avoid okay. Um, you know, the, the, uh, the U.S., the, the, the distrust, uh, high yield investment and workout expertise it is quintessentially a U.S. expertise, you know, starting in the late 80s, early 90s. That, uh, that that and, and played out, you know, in the states, uh, starting with obviously the, the RTC days, and then you know, uh, circa '95, you, know, you started having corporate restructurings, the Bloomingdale's, the Macy's. Then it kind of got exported to Europe. You know, you started seeing names like your Disney, your Tunnel, uh, and and what you have is to take some of that expertise, and I, I would tell you that, uh, that, that that expertise is 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 a small club. There's not there's not hundreds of. Uh, Train, you know, experienced portfolio managers that have committed a hundred of millions or billions of risk capital to those markets, you know, for, for more than a decade. And what you need is to have, you know, one of those manager on the ground in Tokyo. This is not a long distance business. And it's not for everybody to move, you know, move your family and, uh, and your business to Tokyo. And then what you need to do, as was alluded before, is the credit skills in Japan are scarce. This is a business that's all done in Japanese. And, and, and adapting a U.S. distrust and workout culture in a Japanese context. So you need to find, you know, the, the, among the handful of Japanese professionals that actually have some investment, you know, uh, distrust investment workout experience and assemble a team like that. Not for everybody. In addition to that, the way the Japanese are selling is through private auction. It's not at all like in Korea or like in the RTC days where you got 500 million open bidding, everybody's invited. Actually, what they do is invite two, three qualified bidders, and it's a, it's a, it's a very clubby thing. So, you know, a big part of what needs to happen as an investor is find your way into the origination flow. Very, very difficult. It's not just with money. So those are, those are some of the very significant barriers to enter. I will tell you the last one is just sheer scale. Uh, to be even at scale, you know, and you need a workout company on the ground. You quickly need, you know, a team of 50, 75, 100 people. This is not like in the States, you know, where, where just with a small team of, of analysts you can be in business and investment banks are going to bring you product. So you've got to do it all. Go grab the product and go, and go work it out. And as, you, as I told you earlier, the numbers, you know, uh, one of the first options we got invited was 200 million cash. The seller is looking at you and saying, do you have the 200 million cash? That's that's what you got to be able to line up, you know, immediately on the table day one to be in the business. It's, it's also just, not a, it's not a corporate reorganization market. It's generally saying, and it's very true. It's the companies don't air that dirty laundry, so it's, you can look at it. You can look at it. Oh no, you can't look at it. And um, in the corporate reorganization world, um, the Japanese um, don't have the willingness to go through the pain and suffering that the U.S. went through in the early 90s. They don't have the the, the uh, uh, I think fortitude to, to inflict that whatever damage, whether it's going to last a year or a year and a half on society, they, they don't want to cope with the firings and, and the re restructuring uh, you know, the pain that, that uh, probably could be cleaned up in a year, a year and a half. So you see these large corporations with huge indebtedness to banks, and the banks say, well, I can either sell it to a distressed investor at 30 cents, or I can, I can forgive it, you know, and say, I, I shouldn't have loaned you the money. Okay, I'm going to forgive it, I shouldn't have loaned the money. And you're in these syndicates, and all the banks are forgiving, and you have to forgive. There's no ability to enforce that claim. So the, the only opportunity step is really doing what John Lee's doing, which is this very sophisticated asset-backed sort of um, uh, approach. Although I would say times are changing. You know, there's uh, two rational big lenders in, in Tokyo now. Uh, Long-term credit bank was, uh, was bought by Ripplewood, a private equity shop. It's called Shinsei. Uh, they, they stopped doing exactly what David said and forced Sogo into bankruptcy and restructuring. So I would, I would take issue with the fact that actually we're now seeing 
a wave of, of an earnest corporate restructuring. Right. The only reason they forced that reorganization is they could put those loans back to the government. Sure. Which you don't have. If, if, so if you're just going to Japan and saying, I'm going to buy this bank loan. Well, if, unless you have a deal with the government, which only Ripple Wood and another bank has, you can't put your, your loan back. So it's very dangerous to go out and start speculating on, on Japanese corporate defaults because you're probably being a syndicate that is going to forgive their debt. So they're in a great opportunity. Anyone else? Uh, yes, to make a point here. Can Regarding the uh, legal word, uh, Japan is known as a uh, um, protected market. I was wondering if there is any uh, disadvantage of being a foreign investor. You know, competing with the Japanese investors, something like a uh, soft bank. What, what's interesting, you know, is uh, Japan is no different than Europe. You know, if you looked at what happened in Europe in '95, uh, you know, when the market started with your Euro your Disney, if you looked at the players, they were not the French banks, they were not the British banks. They were Goldman Sachs, they were Oak Tree, they were the same distressed players. It's fundamentally a a, a, a U.S. distress. And the same thing is happening in Japan. No buyers among the Japanese. The only Japanese player that you see from time to time is a company called Arx. And, and what's interesting is it is almost like the situation where uh, currently in Japan is a little bit of almost like a win-win-win. <coughs> Japanese banks are kind of, you know, they've written off the loans to zero. They, 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 they actually want the mess out selling it to people like us at five cents, seven cents. They're done with it, they repeat equity value, they're moving on to actually you know, transform them, themselves as banks. And also culturally, they don't want to do the, the hard workouts that need to be done, you know, both, you know to, to work out the credits. There's also a moral hazard. You know, what we do when we buy five cents on the dollar, we go see the bar and we cut a deal. And, and, and literally, we, we, in, in two thirds of the case, the bar will find the seven cents to pay us back. Uh, in, in, if the Japanese banks were trying to know to cut those deals, they would have a line, you know, across the block, and their level of non-performing loans would go through the roof. So you, you have this interesting situation where actually foreign buyers, the few that, that can overcome the barriers to entry, are actually welcome to, to some extent. You know, clearly the Japanese know the returns we're making. The returns are, 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 are really outrageous returns at this point. You know, they're, they're, they're kind of private equity returns. Uh, and and, and, and but still they've been selling. The pace of selling has been accelerating. A lot of these loans you're collecting from the Yakas and people like that. You're going to pachinko parlors, right? And, and, and enforcing plans. And people don't have anything to do with that. So that's a great opportunity. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, very, very little. Uh, here again, I, I think one of the strengths of, of, of our group is kind of knowing where we can add value. You know, the busted convert market is a market that historically has got its own kind of group. You know, there's convert groups. Um, we have enough to focus on what we do that it's something where we'll look at a few if we see something that looks really intriguing with maybe a bank loan that might be outstanding. Um, but busted converts by themselves is not a high priority for us. Anyone else? Well, I think uh, the uh, Q&A has lasted longer than the presentations. I want to thank our speakers for a terrific job.